okay good morning students today once again i visit you with orbit series our topic for discussion this morning is on orbital cellulitis the term cellulitis refers to inflammation or infection of um, cells but of course it will involve the skin causes redness pain but of course let's narrow down our discussion to the orbit in previous classes we discussed about the orbital septum which is what you find here that particular structure which prevents infection from entering into the orbit but the orbital septum as you can see is found within the eyelids but here you have the orbital fascia also known as what the tino tino capsule that is found from the eyelid from the orbital margins lining at the interior portion of the orbit so let's look at the paranasal sinuses which we talked about last week you know these are the paranasal sinuses the front eyes here these are the ethmoida and those are the maxillary so let's now narrow down discussion to orbital cellulitis what is orbital cellulitis well it is the infection of the soft tissue within the orbital cavity but this particular portion is posterior to the word orbital septum if this infection is anterior to the orbital septum then call it what preceptor cellulitis but in case of orbital cellulitis the infection is found in the soft tissue which is posterior to the the orbital septum right so this is typical picture of orbital cellulitis in the left eye at the left side this same person the eyelid has been forced open all right so you look at all the congestion within the conjunctiva and the other intraocular structures okay look at some discharge over here this is orbital cellulitis this is a picture of a child who has orbital cellulitis look at how the picture it's so classical and it's something that you should not miss in your practice even if you are not in ophthalmology practice you can find this in internal medicine in pediatrics and also in your practice you should be able to identify that this is orbital cellulitis and that because of its anatomical proximity to vital structures like the brain it's of so much importance and you should know how to identify and manage it so this is a typical picture look at on my left this preceptor cellulitis and on my right we have the orbital cellulitis in the preceptor cellulitis as i said the infection is anterior to the soft tissue uh, that is in front of the orbital septum but in orbital cellulitis the infection has gone into the soft tissue within the orbit but posterior to the orbital septum anyway so let us now go into details what are the major causes and risk factors of orbital cellulitis? We spoke about it last week that sinus related infections. Here we have sinusitis. Okay, almost all the sinuses when they get infected are capable of causing what? Orbital cellulitis. But the most common one is what? The ethmoid. Ethmoida sinus that when it gets infected it can easily cause orbital cellulitis so another cause of orbital cellulitis is when there is extension okay from preceptor cellulitis we said preceptor cellulitis the infection is limited to the soft tissue 
in the orbit that is anterior to the orbital septum. So when the preceptor solaritis becomes extended, complicated, more serious, then it turns into what orbital cellulitis. So that's another etiology. Another one is local spread. Local spread. Local spread from that cryocystitis. Sometimes to we have dental infection or dental problems. And infection from dental problems can easily invade the orbit and cause what orbital cellulitis. Remember that the maxillary sinus is just found here and the maxillary sinus is on top of the buccal cavity so any infection from the buccal cavity can easily bring about maxillary sinusitis and maxillary sinusitis can lead to what orbital cellulitis another cause is hematogenous spread any infection in any part of your body can spread the microorganism that are causing the infection can spread through blood and then inoculate themselves within the orbit and cause orbital cellulitis. Another one is when there's trauma to the eyeball and then the orbit. So we call it post-traumatic injury. Okay, so that can also cause orbital cellulitis within 72 hours of the injury. Sometimes too, after eye surgeries okay any type of eye surgery after it it can cause orbital cellulitis so these are the major causes of orbital cellulitis so let's shift our attention to epidemiology epidemiology so it occurs more in winter than in summer why because in winter we are more prone to have an upper respiratory tract infections. And as we spoke about in previous classes, upper respiratory tract infections can give way to sinusitis, and in turn, sinusitis can give way to orbital cellulitis. And remember, upper respiratory tract infections are more common during the winter. Or in our environment where we don't have winter, we might have more beta cellulitis occurring in colder weather than when the weather is warm. It's also important to know that in children, males are more affected than in females. I think the reason is obvious. You know, males are more outgoing. They may involve themselves in more outdoor activities. So they might easily get a respiratory tract infection more than the females. And that accounts for why orbital cellulitis in children is more in the male group than in the females. In fact, the ratio is about two times more in males than in females. But in adults, males and females are what? Equally affected. Males and females are equally affected in adults. In general, orbital cellulitis is more common in children than in adults. If you forget about any fact at all, remember that upper respiratory tract infections are more in children than in adults. So therefore, it's easier to understand why the orbital cellulitis is found more in children than in adults. In pathogenesis, I want to say that microorganisms gain access to the orbit through several routes. Okay, one of them is bones of orbital walls. Bones of orbital walls. These bones may be thin. Okay, so the thin bones of orbital walls and the thinness of all the orbital walls, as we spoke about in previous classes, is the media wall. In fact, the media wall is also called lamina papyracea. Here, it means that it's paper thin. And if it's paper thin, it means that microorganisms can easily perforate through the walls in the media area, the bones in the media wall, and enter into the orbit and cause the infection. Another reason given is venous channels. There are several venous channels 
on the face. So any facial infection, and there are also viral venal channels within the mucosa of the sinuses. So infections around these areas easily germs can travel through these particular venal channels and then enter into the orbit and cause orbital cellulitis. We also spoke about foramina within the orbit. Okay, the infraorbital foramen, supraorbital foramen, superorbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure, orbit canal, optic canal. So all these foramina are routes through which okay microorganisms can travel and cause infections within the orbit. We should not forget to also know that at the very same media wall we have perforations, weaknesses, dehiscences within the lamina papyracea, which is technically known as me, uh, make a candles dehiscence, okay? The candles dehiscence. So, through these dehiscences, microorganisms travel and cause infection within the, sorry, it's called Zucca candle. Zucca candles dehiscence. Through these particular dehiscences, microorganisms travel and enter into the orbit and cause what? Orbital cellulitis. Let us now talk about the bacteria. You know, orbital cellulitis can be caused by different uh, agents. Bacteria, fungi, vira, and the list is tall. But our attention today is more on the bacteria, which is more, this is the most common of all of them. So with bacteria are uh, mostly found causing orbital cellulitis. We have the Streptococcus species, followed by Staphylococcus aureus. Not forgetting that Haemophilus influenzae type B are all involved in causing orbital cellulitis. Patients with orbital cellulitis may present to you with fever, chills, general malaise, pain inability to move their eyeball and there's also rapid onset of the malaise okay so on examination you find obviously swollen eyeball proptosis okay you can find that the eyeball is obviously swollen and if you look at the size of the two eyeballs the one with the orbital cellulitis is protruded protruded it has gone a bit outside the orbital cavity and appears bigger so they tend to have proptosis okay and some clients may present with discharge have you seen some discharge over here okay so oh uh, it is also obvious to know that there's unilateral tender have you seen this eye is usually tender? Okay, there's warm and periorbital lid edema. Have you seen the edema around the eyelids? Okay, periorbital lid edema. There's also erythema on those who are light skinned. Okay, erythema and rubor or reddening around the eyelids in those who are fair. But you see the proptosis. Okay. And we call something painful ophthalmoplegia. Ophthalmoplegia means that the patient cannot move the eyeball in any direction. Okay? But then it is painful. Alright? Okay. So, it is important to know that there are certain other features that of complications that can set in orbital cellulitis. We can talk about the orbital, the ocular complications. We can talk about the intracranial complications and then there's also subperusia abscess. So what ocular complications can come? Patients can get exposure, keratopathy. A time will come, you see the eyelid like this, but when you analyze it critically under the microscope, you realize that they cannot close the eyeball 100%. So part of the ocular surface is what exposed, especially the cornea. So we call it what exposure keratopathy. 
you can also have increase intraocular pressure okay increase intraocular pressure because the pistola vein is compressed because of the tight area within the orbit okay patients are also prone to having central retinal artery occlusion or sometimes central retinal vein occlusion they can also develop endophthalmitis and of course compressive optic neuropathy intracranially the complications may include meningitis brain abscess cavernous sinus thrombosis in fact when you have cavernous sinus thrombosis the patient the presentation is bilateral and patient is in prostration and the problem is rapidly progressive with proptosis so the third and the last but not the least complication could be what saperiostia abscess okay the bone around the orbit the, the or within the orbit start getting what abscess and it start from the what the media wall so how do we treat this type of uh, patient okay first and foremost it is an emergency whether in ophthalmology in internal medicine or in pediatrics it is an emergency so if you have an emergency will you let the patient walk home no you have to admit the patient but there's one thing that you should know about this orbital cellulitis and the preceptor cellulitis remember there are certain cardinal differences okay the globe is firmly closed in orbital cellulitis that is the difference whilst in preceptor cellulitis the eyelid is not firmly closed if you want to open the eyelid you can easily open in preceptor cellulitis but in orbital cellulitis it's quite difficult trying to open the eyelid there's more tenderness in orbital cellulitis there's less tenderness in preceptor cellulitis and you should also remember that because the infection has traveled into the orbit itself bypassing the pre the uh, the orbital septum it to have affected the stroclear muscles said that the patient will not be able to move the eyeball in any direction in orbital cellulitis i repeat the infection will have traveled inside the soft tissue of the orbit behind the, pre the orbital septum to cause infection within the orbit and this will affect the stroclear muscle so much so that the person or the affected patient cannot move the eyeball in any direction in orbital cellulitis on the contrary in preceptor cellulitis because the infection has not crossed the orbital septum barrier into the orbit the extraocular muscles are still intact so what it means is that the client or the patient in preceptor cellulitis can move the eyeball in all directions why because the extraocular muscles are not affected so every time when in doubt please check extraocular motility let the patient look to the left to the right up down in fact in all directions and if they cannot do this movement on their eyeball it means that most likely it is orbital cellulitis but if it's preceptor cellulitis the client will be able to move the eyeball in all directions why the need to establish this difference which is vital it's important because it will determine the type of antibiotic the route of administration whether you let the patient stay in the hospital on admission or you let the patient go home. And it is simple. In orbital cellulitis, which is the most serious of the two, you have to admit the patient, okay, on the ward and start intravenous antibiotics. Which antibiotics? Hey, we cannot do all the tests to get the causative microorganism, the etiological agent. So what do we do? You give intravenous antibiotics for against sorry against gram-positive microorganisms, 
can negative microorganism and of course against any ropes. A is important to start treatment as soon as possible and of course this can be done this should be done with the patient being on admission and while patient is admission we monitor optic nerve function because the content within the orbit are now congested okay they are congested some of them might be compressed on the optic nerve so you monitor optic nerve function how check regularly visual acuity, you check color vision, you check visual fills, you check pupillary reaction to light, and if it's possible, you do fundoscopy to elicit the appearance and the nature of the optic nerve, of the optic disc, okay, to know its function. So, you have to do some ancillary tests although it is straightforward because some conditions or diseases may mimic optic cellulitis. What do we do? We do full blood count. Why? You want to know leukocytosis, the white blood count cells are usually increased. Okay? And you can do, uh, depending upon the presentation, all patients may not present the same. So depending upon the presentation, if you think that it's of hematogenous spread, you can do blood culture, okay? Sometimes too, you can do CT scan of brain orbit and paranasal sinuses, okay? You can see the structures that are behind the orbital septum inflamed. So because this is CT scan, we call it hyperdense, okay? Hyperdensities just refer to the whitening compare the, this orbit here to that orbit you realize that the orbit here is whiter okay it's whiter look at the nerve look at the media rectus look at the lateral rectus over here and there's more opacification because it is can we say what hyperdense the area is hyperdense within the orbit okay so you don't do lumbar puncture unless uh, the, you really uh, suspect meningitis and what the causative microorganisms sometimes we go surgical we do surgical intervention and the indications for surgical intervention in management of orbital cellulitis include one well, lack of response to antibiotics and progression of the disease because of anatomical proximity to the brain you don't want it to escalate and go into the brain so when there's subperiosteal abscess or intracranial abscess that one calls for what surgical intervention or sometimes to when there's atypical presentation then you want to do biopsy and elicit what is causing what remember that there's differential diagnosis it is not everybody who comes with this type of problem that has what orbital cellulitis but you at least have some differentials at the back of your mind remember the way the patient has it in the left eye if the same thing happens rapidly in the right eye the fever is increasing patient is prostration the patient is really not in good state when all these things happen, then quickly think about cavernous sinus thrombosis. It means that there has been what? Intracranial extension. We talk about the structure within the cavernous sinus and that when they are affected, you can imagine, they can easily lead to death. So, we talk about cavernous differential diagnosis, cavernous sinus thrombosis. Of course, we talk about what? Preceptor cellulitis, okay? And that differential diagnosis of the cellulitis is what? Preceptor cellulitis. And remember, there's another disease called what? Caroid eye disease. Okay? Well, it comes when there's endocrine dysfunction. That can also appear like orbital cellulitis. Of course, the hormones FT3, FT4, TSH are all what? Deranged in what? Thyroid eye disease. If it's in children, think of what? retinal 
blastoma as what your differential okay student before i bring my curtains down i want to assure you that this type of problem cast across specialties in neurosurgery in pediatrics in internal medicine and if you have an eye that when you see a client with orbital cellulitis you should be able to diagnose and institute some form of therapy to avoid complications because it can easily lead to death please continue reading your notes watch this particular uh, slides learn more and clarify your doubts in class until we meet again i'll see you and take good care of yourselves